Hello and welcome to PM Personality Profile. My name is Nana Sakwa the Fourth, Chief of the One and Only Little Republic of Akomo Edumasa. And you know it, every Friday, every Sunday afternoon, I come to your home and when I come, I bring a guest, somebody who has a live story to share, somebody who has a defined moment that we can pick inspiration from. And I must say, I've done really good, you know, in the recent weeks where I mostly bring you women achievers. And I think I pat myself on the back for doing that. And today, I have another woman achiever to share her story with us. Now, for a long time, I thought that this lady would be a mathematician. She's called Doctor. And she's always talking about statistics, statistics. Oh, well, and she must be an academician, mathematician, somewhere like that. So I was surprised to know that, no, she's actually a medical officer. So then why is she talking so much statistics and so much mathematics and numbers, sometimes delving even into economy? Well, we're going straight to the National Population Council to see if the uh, executive director, Dr. Leticia Apia, to find out why or how it is that a medical doctor is so engrossed with maths, numbers, and stats. And she had the audacity to tell us to give birth to three. Three, can you imagine? When God has asked us to populate the world as much as the seashore, she said, no. Three is the ideal number. Somewhere in the interview, I'll try and find out why she came up with this magic three. Some agree, some have disputed, but hey, we have her to speak to it herself. My name again, Nanan Sakwa. And when I come back, I'm talking to Dr. Leticia Apia, don't go away. Well, thank you very much. Finally, finally, uh, we get the opportunity to hear your life story. So I want to say thank you very much for granting us the time. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to go straight to Jessica, <laughs> all the way to Jessica. Okay. And uh, did you did you grow up in Jessica? No, no, no. I was actually born in Jessica, but I didn't grow up. Well, I stayed in Jessica when I was small because okay. that's where I was born. Uh, my dad was a paramount chief in Tapabutuasi, okay. a very big family. Princess Leticia. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many of us, the children. We are about forty. For my dad. F 14 or 40? 40. 40. 40. Four zero. Four zero. <laughs> <laughs> this, this number will become very significant <laughs> later, later in the interview. Yes, that's, that's a big, a big, a big family. And my mom, it's a, a teacher. She's, okay. Yeah, she was a teacher. She's on retirement now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was born in Jessica and, and we came to Great Accra, Newtown, and that's where I actually grew up. That's where I remember, in Newtown. Growing up in Newtown. Yes. Share, let's, let's, let's share some of the stories in, uh, in, in Newtown. What was growing up in Newtown like? Well, growing up in Newtown, I attended ANT1 primary school and I went to class one. My teacher, Mrs. George, yes, Mrs. George, and uh, I am a left, I'm left handed, mm -hmm. and Mrs. George couldn't take that writing with your left. So, beating every day. And oh dear. Yes, one day. I came home, my mom was getting us ready for school, and I said, I'm done with school. I'm not going to school anymore. So she asked why. I said, well, I write with my left, and the teacher doesn't want me to do that. She keeps beating me for whatever reason. My mom took me straight to the head teacher's place and told her that, just leave her to write with her left, because I, my mom, is also left-handed. Okay. But then she was beaten to pulp, so she changed. So she writes with her right, but that's everything else with the left. So like chopping so, and stuff? Chopping, and everything, eating, cooking, everything with her left, left just right, right with her right, yes. I, mean, I don't know why. I wonder how many children have suffered this left to right thing. Because like you're saying, you, you decided, look, I'm not going to go to school again. Yes, no, no. I think it's a big thing we really need to look at. Because then I have three girls and two of them are left-handed. Wow. Yes. My mom was left-handed, I'm left-handed and I have three girls and two are left-handed. But we really need to look at that because I don't know how many people, because of that, fell off. I was mm -hmm. lucky to have a mom who noticed and took me to school, you know, and impressed on my teacher to let me stay. And I think for me, it's a very big defining moment for me. And because of that, growing up, 
you feel there's something wrong with you. Why is everybody writing with their right and you're writing with your left? And I happened to be tall too, and not my friends are short. So I said, why am I so tall and writing with my left hand? What did I do to God to merit this, you know? So... The old one out. The old one out. The old one out, Nana. And it's not comfortable. Hmm. You know, human beings want to belong. Mm -hmm. So when you are old at that age, and society is also not appreciating, then you tend to lose self-confidence. You know, you tend to lose some confidence in yourself. But for me, I was privileged to go outside the country. And that is when I said, oh, okay. So it doesn't really... Uh, I'm not uh, odd after all, you know. I'm probably just unique. <laughs> <laughs> the American president. Uh, I'm left handed. Be, being left handed. Yes. And there you are, you will be allowed to be a class prefect. No, not a class prefect, <laughs> but left alone, <laughs> a chief or a queen mother. <laughs> so after, after, you know, you were allowed to you know, write with your left, you sail through, through normally with your, with your left hand? Yes, I sailed normally with my left handed, left handedness. I think learning came very easy to me, you mm. know, yes, learning comes very easy to me. And I'm an introvert too, a lot of people think I'm an extrovert, no, but naturally I'm an introvert, you know, so I just do what I, I know how to do best. And I was never interested in steady groups because they always took me back somehow, you know, I always felt that I was always teaching, you know, I wasn't <laughs> being taught, I was always teaching, I ended up teaching all the time. So I studied alone. I moved faster that way. So I finished uh, ANT1. I went to ANT1 primary in uh, Accra Newtown, Accra Newtown 1 primary. And then my father actually uh, took me to St. John's when I was in class six. So I went to St. John's and s spent a year there, had my common entrance, passed very well, and uh, went to Ola Secondary School. You know, I told you my father was a chief, mm -hmm. so he was part of the Volta Regional House of Chiefs. So he had a lot of influence in the Volta region. You know? <laughs> so his, his children went to a KJB Asato Secondary School, and I went to, to Ola Secondary School. Okay. Yeah. So your, your, your boys were Bishop Herman, right? Yes, <laughs> Bishop Herman. In fact, I had a boy who I don't even know. I didn't even know who he was. But, <laughs> but he was in Bishop Herman. But he was in Bishop Herman. <laughs> Bishop Herman boys had a reputation when we, yes. know, when we were growing up. Uh, they had a reputation yes. of being hard boys. Then from Ola you came to Achimota. Yes, from Ola I came to Achimota. Let me tell you something that happened in Ola. You know, I'm tall and uh, I was in a Sicilia house. Yes, in Sicilia house. And we always had this inter house competition, mm -hmm. you know. And people yeah. were going to train for the sports. And I said, no, I'm so tall. My reach is very, you know, so I don't need to train. You know, I can just get onto the track and win the race. That's what I thought. If and you, I got on if track. Take, if you take one step, do you have to take three? Do you have to take three. So I was calculating. <laughs> you see, everything is mad, <laughs> including sports, but I didn't work there. So I was calculating and not bothering myself with uh, uh, practicing in anything. And I got on track. I couldn't go 100 meters and I was dying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just had to be off. And then I concluded since then that practice is everything. Mm. That if you have to excel, you have to invest time, energy into it and practice. It doesn't come, it doesn't come easily. easily. Whether your legs were Whether long. Your legs were long. <laughs> In fact, the one who, who won had the shorted legs. <laughs> and, then she, she practiced. and she actually went on to uh, represent the region very okay. athletic, yes. Okay. Well, she was short, and I was comparing myself to her. That okay, was this short that thing. This short thing, no problem. <laughs> Did you do well in maths in school? No, no, maths is my best subject. I think maths is the easiest subject. And I think life is about maths. And I think many of our viewers would so and disagree with you. And I think God you. is a mathematician. Everything mm. is maths. Medicine is maths. Now, now your BP has figures. Mm. Your HB has figures. Mm -hmm. Your height has figures. Your BMI has figures. Even the spectacles you are mm. wearing has figures, figures, you know? They will check and tell you six over six vision. It's all figures. So life is actually mathematics. Wow. Seamstresses use figures. Building mm. construction, these figures. If you don't go very deep and you put a story building on, what happens? It crumbles. Mm. So it's figures. The earlier we accepted, the better for us. Wow. Yes, that is why it is only in math that we never go to the high court for interpretation. Because one plus one is two. <laughs> Nobody needs to <laughs> interpret it. But in literature, you have to go to the high court 
for somebody, a tenth person, to tell you what you're reading. Mm -hmm. Mass, you don't do that. Wow. How, how come it's such a feared subject? Well, maybe because we have not really taken time to look at it. No, no, everything is mad. The food you eat is mad. You go to the nutritionist and they tell you take three square meals a day, this volume, this amount. That calories. Then, that this. calories. The doctor will tell you sleep eight hours a day. It's mad. You have a baby, you take the baby to weigh in and they are checking the weight, matching against the standard. Everything is mad. So the standards are mad. Wow. You know, if we look at it that way, can you imagine you going to a seamstress and the person using any measurements for clothes for you? It's mad. They check your waist, your bust, and your hip, and that is mathematics. I see. So life is really mathematics. So you, you, you enjoy it. I, I love maths because it's undisputable. If wow. the facts are facts, you cannot dispute the facts. From Achimota, you traveled outside or you did university here? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I went to Ola, six, I mean, from one to five, I sat for the common entrance. I excelled. So I moved from Achimota, I mean, from Ola to Achimota School for my sixth form. You know, people were moving other side, but I was moving against the tide, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people always move from Achimota to out, but I was moving into Achimota. You know, I started from Newtown to Ola and then to Achimota. I think life is a forward match. So you're going up in the world. Going up, you know, world. there should always be an improvement. When you retrogress, then it's not the best. You know? But, I mean, growing up in uh, Newtown, how many siblings were you then? Well, my mommy had uh, two other girls. Two other girls. So I have two siblings, two three siblings. of us, yes. But my daddy were... Well, my daddy yes, a whole defined defi defi everything three, that you stand for. Yes, two or three football teams and some <laughs> reserves. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to, like, sell and, you know, work hard for your survival. Yes. It was not that, it wasn't easy because my mommy, a teacher, how much do you earn, you know? So we had to sell bread, we had to sell uh, oil, we had to sell everything and anything, you know? And I had to walk from Newtown. We actually lived opposite the Malata market. So I had to walk from Newtown to Accra Central, sold in front of the uh, fire service, you know? And walk back home to support. And at that age, I mean, because all this time you're doing well in school, did you still have it in that look, I need to study hard and get out of this, or it came to you naturally? No, no, that age, I still knew that was the only way out. Because there was so this so was about 14, 16? Yes, 14, 16, yes, around that. I knew that was the, I just felt that that was the only way out. Because I told you my father had so many of us, and uh, he was probably concentrating more on the boys than on the girls because mm -hmm. as for girls, they will marry off and all mm -hmm. those things, you know, not much investment in them. So I just felt that that was the only way out. And I really didn't like uh, um, where I was living, even though I was content. So I knew that if you had to get out of this place, and we've always been told, my mommy kept, kept telling me that, I mean, study hard and you can get to anywhere you want to get to, and I believed it. You know, so, and learning also came naturally to me. It wasn't difficult for me mm -hmm. to learn. So then, that's all I had. So that's all I had to use. It's in the Bible. You use what you have. <laughs> <laughs> and so from Achimota to Russia? Yes. So I went to Achimota. I had two prizes, actually, in sixth form. Wow. I had a physics and From Ola, you came to beat them? Uh, From Achimota. Ola, I came to beat them in Achimota, and they couldn't take it. <laughs> so they said I was a witch. That's so bad. <laughs> yes. So Achimota came as a scholarship or as some savings? or Actually, in Ola, I think my parents had to pay just for the first year. Then I got a CMB scholarship. So God mm -hmm. has really been good to me. And the farmers have been so good to me, I think it's payback time. <laughs> yes. So I got scholarship and that has been it, because it would have been very tough for us. Wow. And is that the same scholarship that took you to Russia? Yes. So my mommy also went looking for scholarship for me. And you know, the scholarship secretariat gave scholarships for people to go okay. to Eastern Europe then, yes. So she was very forceful. She, she, she's she's a, a good mom. Very hard, though. <laughs> very hard, but then 
she pushes when she has to push, you know. And I think she saw in me uh, some prospects, so she also did what she had to do. So she uh, got me into the scholarship, secretariat, through some people, I don't know, but through some people. She got me into the scholarship, secretariat, to the Soviet Union. So to the Soviet Union, I went. And uh, initially, I thought she didn't like me around, you know, that's why she was sending me away to such a far off place, no mobile phones, nothing, you can't call, you can't do anything. No, but on hindsight, she did a good job. I actually also applied to tech, and I was called mm -hmm. to tech, but then I had already gone. She made a good choice for me. She said, you can go to tech, you can learn, but learning is not everything. You need the enabling environment. You would need money, you would need all these sort of things, you know, to, to support you, and I may not be able to, to do that. But then if you go to the Soviet Union, you have the scholarship, the uh, Russian government scholarship, and then also the government of Ghana supporting. So, so I went. But since you were so good in maths, I mean, mm. why medicine? She said I should do medicine. I knew I was good, but I didn't really know. She said I should do medicine, and I loved it. And mm. I also, with time, saw that I love to help people. You know, I want people to have a good life. So then it's good. Then I need to reach out and help people. As an avenue to reach out it's and help. As an avenue to reach out and help people, yeah. Maybe because you were so sharp brain, it didn't matter what cause they chose for you. Yes, you know, when I was in, in, in Ola, when I was in Ola, the third year, we had to do typing. You know, we had to do typing. And they, they were given a script to type. I typed the wrong script. And then some minutes to the time, I realized I had typed the wrong script. So I canceled it and typed the correct script. I finished typing the, the, the correct script too. So when the teacher saw it, he said, oh, you're so good, you could be a secretary. Because you were able to type, people were not able to type the, the, the normal script. You did the wrong one. And also completed what perfect, you had to do. Perfect secretary. So perfect secretary you will be. You know, that's what he said. Let me take a quick break. <laughs> we are coming straight back. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for staying. And we are talking to Dr. Leticia Apia, who is Executive Director of National Population Council, whose dad had 40 children. Could that have influenced his uh, inspiration, <laughs> National Population Council? Who knows? But there are defining moments in everybody's life. But can you imagine a teacher telling you that, look, because you can type so good, you know what? You're going to be a good secretary one day. You have found your profession. I mean, at, at that time, I mean, did you take it serious? Did you consider it or did you just laugh it off and walk back? No, I just laughed it off and walked back because, you know, then it would have changed. I, I knew I was going to do science. Okay. And I knew that those, I mean, secretaries normally don't do science. So, But his teacher wanted you to do business, you know, business well, subjects. Yes, yes, he wanted me to do business subjects. And I told you, math is the best. <laughs> <laughs> and you can only do a math when you're a science student. But how come you could type so fast and so good anyway? I don't know. I think when I'm pushed to do something, I always say, uh, when I'm pushed to do something, I get some inner strength and, and do it. I see. I see. So back from, how was your stay in Russia, though? Did you enjoy your stay in Russia? Yes, I did. I did, Nana. It was so interesting. You have to spend a year to learn the language, mm -hmm. and then you, you, you study. And the teacher we had for the language couldn't speak a word in English. You know. So the first uh, couple of days, the class is over and we are still sitting. He says, class over and we are still sitting. <laughs> because we don't understand what he says. And then he would do this. He would say, oh, OK, we should walk out. Then the we will walk out of the <laughs> class. It was very interesting. OK, yeah. so you do language for a year. You do language for a so year. So you do medicine in Russia. You do medicine in Russia. But the beauty of medicine is that you know it's, 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 it's generic or Latin. So the words are the same. Oh. It is appendicitis, it's the same. Appendicitis. Even in Russian, yes. it is appendicitis? Yes, yes. But they don't so. say stethoscope in, in, in English. They don't say stethoscope in whatever <laughs> the other languages. Well, yes, but most of the, most of the, the, the words you could you could relate to okay to yes oh so it, it helps so it helps, it helps. Okay. It does help. i see i see i see uh, any moment in uh, russia that you remember 
do you want to share with us? Well, there are so many moments in Russia. Russia was so interesting because you could take the train from Russia and go through Poland, go through East Germany then, mm -hmm. go through West Germany, get to Hook of Holland, take a ship and go to the U U UK and mm. come and do some work and come back. You know, it's a round <laughs> trip, very interesting. So it was really an eye opener. It opened you uh, to the world. It opened your, your, your world view. So when you come here and people are saying Eastern trained are not good, at times I laugh because they have everything it takes to make a good, a good uh, professional out of you. The equipments are there, they have time for you. So it's, it was fun. Culture shock? Well, yes. In my medical school, there were more females than males. Is it? Yes. I mean, that's, that's a culture <laughs> shock. <laughs> yes, that is it. You know, I said, no. In my country, the men are supposed to be doctors and the women secretaries and all that. But here, we have majority of the women, more, more women in the medical school than boys. Really? So that was, yes, that was, that was a shock. And then also, the other shock was, you go to the shops to go and buy something, your professor is there, and if you went before he came, and it's the queue, he stands behind you. You know, he doesn't take any, there's no <laughs> professor there, you know. He stands behind you, and he understands that he has to stand behind you. you know, so it's, it really makes life. Mm. A, hum a humbling simple. culture shock. Yes. What, what, uh, did, you, did you have to practice a bit in uh, Russia? I mean, work in any clinic before you have to come back? Home? Well, just for the training, because I completed in June 93, mm. and being the patriotic citizen that I, I am, and I think I am, <laughs> <laughs> I came back just the same year. Okay. I came back the same, the very year I completed, because I thought that. The farmers, as I said, the scholarship I got, mm. the cocoa board scholarship and all that, I thought they have invested in me and I needed to come back mm. and pay back, pay back time. So I came and I haven't gone back. No. Yeah. I just wanted to find out how patients in Russia were compared to patients in Kolebu when you came back. That was another shock. You know, I stayed in uh, Russia for, for seven years. And the, the best place for me was the maternity ward. Mm. Because till date, Nana, for me, the birth of a child is, 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 is still a mystery. Mm. You know, and it's, I think it's, it's so divine. So that was a place I really enjoyed, working in the maternity ward. Seeing babies being born. Mm. And the issue is that, Nana, when babies were born in Russia, the parents, uh, the relatives come to pick this baby with flowers and kisses and everything. And it was so beautiful. So I wanted to be a part of that. So I came to Ghana wanting to be a gynecologist so that I could welcome in babies, love those who people who love them. Mm. I came to Kolebu and it was a total different ball game. Babies were born and couldn't care less about them. Sleep on the floor. Some of them crawled on the ward because their parents would not come and discharge them. Mm. Totally unwanted. Then after we're small treated. So I'm asking myself, if we don't want them, why do we have them? It's true. I mean, I, I think I don't we're... think God is excited with us. Look at it's near Christmas. Mm. Look at the preparations the heavens are making, the earth is making to receive his son. And we usher in children and we maltreat them, we rape them, we defy them, we beat them, they take money for I mean they put their hands in soup because they are hungry and we bend their hands. And then we get up every Sunday and go to church. It doesn't fit. It really doesn't fit. I mean, going back to, you know, uh, babies born in the Western world, it just drew my attention. Yeah. You know, it's a boy, it's a yeah, girl with their beautiful. Balloons, balloons and flowers. And this and grandmother baby will come. is sleeping beautiful and you know that you are welcomed. You know that you are loved. You know, and then you see, they bring them for where, you know, you see that the baby is nice and plumpy and laughing and everybody kissing the baby. But in here, the baby comes away and the baby is emaciated and the baby is not, nobody cares for that baby. You know, the baby two years is not working because it's malnourished and then the woman is pregnant again. So is it purposeful giving birth or we're just doing anything? You know, are we thinking through it? So that, that was another shock for you? Yeah. That was a big shock. I have not gotten over that shock. I really haven't gotten over wow. that shock because I put myself in the shoes of those people. It could have been you, it could have been anybody. Mm. 
What if you've had a mother who's treating you that way? You know, it's just by his grace that I had a mom who didn't treat me that way. So it doesn't make me any special. Mm. But why should these children go through that? I don't think it's, it's, it's right. We're abusing their human rights. The fact that they can't talk does not mean that they don't have any. And you did 10 years in Kolebu? Yes, I did 10 years in Kolebu. You see, what informed, I did 10 years in Kolebu. Then I started moving away from the obscene gang because I saw that it was a bottomless pit. Babies come to the bed, you don't, they're not taken good care of. Then the mother comes again another year to birth another baby, also not taken care of. Then the third, the fourth, the fifth. There's no joy in it. Mm. So I decided to do public health, you see, because in clinical medicine, one patient is your client. Mm -hmm. But in public health, the community is your client. Mm. And health is manufactured in the community. So I decided to do public health to see exactly what is happening in the community that we're doing this to ourselves. So I went to the School of Public Health in Lagos. Wonderful teachers there. I did public health. I came back and I said, okay. You know, we have Kolebu and Ghana Health Service. Mm -hmm. So I decided to move from Kolebu to Ghana Health Service. And I had a lot of advisors in Kolebu who, for good reasons, advised me against moving to Ghana Health Service. And they said, you know, Kolebu is the teaching hospital and everything. I said, well, I still want to go to Ghana Health Service. So to Ghana Health Service, I went. And I was posted to Achimota Hospital. Mm -hmm. And because uh, the way I left Kolebu, Dr. Anan, he's my good friend, though. <laughs> but he didn't want me to go to Ghana. I left. So he said, OK, then you're leaving my bungalow. I said, no problem. So they ejected me from Kolebu. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to Achimota. So I stayed in Achimota for a while and then um, worked in other places. And in 2008, when we had new districts being formed, I was posted to the Yohuku Kro, that is Lekma, okay. to, to head the place. So we, I headed Lekma. And since inception, the inception was in 2008. Mm -hmm. So I headed Lekma, Lekma to 2016, when I was appointed as the executive director for the National Population Council. I mean, uh, community health. Uh, <coughs> Did you find it more refreshing or was more heartbreak? You see, for medical, uh, for medical services, it's a continuum of care. Mm. Curative, preventive, link up. Prevention first. If you can't prevent the disease and you get sick, then you come to the hospital. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's a continuum of care. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to prevent diseases. Mm. You see, I think the focus is more beneficial and more cost effective to prevent diseases than to cure. So the more people you can, you can support to stay healthy, the less people will get sick. And the more productive the countries are anyway. Mm. You know. And public health looks at the community as one. Public health is about immunizations. Public health is about sanitation. Public health is about water supply. You know, public health is about the air you breathe. So making sure that people are healthy, making sure that people have what it takes to take care of other human beings. Mm. Public health is about family planning. Planning your family is public health. Mm. Because if you plan your family very well, and they are healthy, well-nourished, sleep well, have leisure time, they fall sick less often. Mm. And so then you relieve the clinical staff of work. And when you relieve clinical staff of work, what happens is that you improve quality of care. Mm. Because if there are less people, then they, are, they have time to upgrade themselves, to give the scare back to the community. So it is very important that we look at everything in totality. We need to have the best eye view, and that's what public health does. It looks at the best, the best eye view. Not just sitting in the clinic, people have diarrhea, they can't treat them. They have diarrhea, they can't treat them. Meanwhile, the water source is the problem. Meanwhile, it's the water source. So which, which is better, sitting in the clinic and treating diarrhea, or fixing the water pipe. But were you surprised at, I don't know whether it's uh, ignorance towards uh, sanitation or just that we didn't care about it. I mean, once you moved, were you surprised about the community? You know, you know are they not concerned about this or they were not aware of it? I mean, did you have any shocks like that? Well, public health gives you, opens you up. You know, public mm -hmm. health opens you up. It makes you appreciate data. 
and you know i love maths too mm. <laughs> so data comes in you know it makes you appreciate data to inform policy mm -hmm. policy is based on data data collected at the, the the facility level and even in the communities you know so public health opens you up if you're not careful and you stay a clinician and you don't have that big eye view you will just be breaking your back seeing that one person you treat the person the person goes back to the community and comes back with the disease you treat the person the person goes back to the community and comes back to the, with the disease you know so at times you need to move from the clinic to the community if you want to make maximum impact the, the, see, the reason i ask this question is i'm surprised that uh, one of the statistics is that 25 percent of children die before their age of five because they drank bad water and I don't know, I just thought it was almost instinctive for a mother to know that I have to give the baby clean water. I, I just thought it's like instinct. I didn't even think somebody had to teach you. So I was shocked about the number of children who would die before the age of five because their water wasn't filtered or wasn't boiled before. I, I don't yes, know. That is true. So what countries have done, developed, is that they make sure that whether you know it or not, the water source is clean. So that the water that runs through your pipe is clean. That is public health, mm -hmm. you know. So then they take, you see, public health has to try and take some of the burden off the people. So it doesn't behove the mother to filter the water or to boil the water anymore. But then the pipes are piped and from the source, the water is clean, mm -hmm. you know. But like you're saying, it's true. The mothers will have to go through this lens. To, 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 to filter the water or boil the water for the children. But how much do I have to buy charcoal? How much do I have to buy charcoal? To it's a real water. situation. Yes. Wow. Now, so, there you are. I mean, <clears throat> like I said in my intro, I, I always thought you were a you know, PhD academician. You know, when I had doctor, doctor, and every time I hear you speak, it was that number, that percentage, this percentage, some economic statistics. I thought, oh, yeah, you know, I never knew you were a medical, <laughs> medical doctor. So I'm trying to find out how it is that you moved from the clinic to, you know, championing or crusading population. Nana, I think it's all fitting. I think it's all crystallizing who I am. Because medicine, you see, I, I, I see science, you can divide science into two. Mm. You have the arts of science and the science of science. The arts of science, I put it that those who do medicine, biology, and not too much inclined into mathematics. And then the science of science are those who do the core uh, as, uh, maths, they go into the engineering, the mathematicians who forget to comb their hair and those other things, you know. <laughs> so to get the... the <laughs> I am not editing that. <laughs> I'm keeping that in there. You know, but to get the bridge, those who would use the, the, the maths and the data to inform policy, for me, I think that's why I fall. Mm. You know, because I love medicine. It's good. And I love the data. And I want the data to tell the story. Mm -hmm. I want the data to give it the direction. Because data doesn't lie. Just like day and night. Day is 12 hours, night is 12 hours. And like I said, God is a mathematician. Because you see, the world is made of 30% water. I mean, no, 70% water and 30 mass. And the human being is made of what? 70% water and 30 mass. Is that not mathematics? That's God at play mm -hmm. with figures, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that... We, ha we have to let nature at times inform the things that we do. Mm. You know, I think that uh, uh, the, 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 the loss of nature is the loss of God. You know? So we have to let nature direct us. Mm. We cannot move against nature if, if, we want to, if we want to. If we want to be successful. I mean, was it, I mean, leaving the clinic, leaving the medical bit into NPC, uh, any culture shock there since you seem to be moving from place to place? What, what was your first culture shock at NPC? <laughs> Do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> my, first, my first culture shock was, ah, she's not a demographer, what's she doing here? Mm -hmm. And 
you know, she's not a demographer. Mm -hmm. What's she doing? It? I said, I'm a public health specialist. Demography uh, variables and population variables and public health variables are the same, one and the same. Mm. You know, you need to just interpret them in your context. So that was it. I mean, uh, a doctor stays with Ghana Health Service. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> doctors are supposed to, either you have Ghana Health Service or you move outside the Ghana Health Service into a different, whether, I mean, to another field. But to move and still apply your Ghana Health Service knowledge and skills in MPC was another thing that probably people did not really appreciate where I was coming from. Now, you, you gave the controversial number of three. Well, I'm sure there were two schools of thoughts where two thirds were against and probably a, a quarter. Uh, I, I agreed with you, but they were thinking, you know, why three? You know, where from that number? We can have as many as we want if we can look after them. So why, why, why three? Yeah, Nana, I, I was also shocked about the response because it's not my figure. It's actually data that we're not looking at, you yes. know. Yes, people have done research. There's a paper I read from 170, 194 countries, 194 countries. And the conclusion John Ross, I think, yes, John Ross and his uh, partner came out with, they gave us demographic risks. You see, demographic risks. You see, you, 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 should, you have uh, human rights and science. Human rights and science merge to inform policies. That is why, for instance, the police will tell you that go 80 kilometers per hour. You have your own car. The speedometer is 200 kilometers by the manufacturer, but then the police say go 80 kilometers per hour because you need to be protected. The people around you need to be protected, and I mean we need you need your life because we've invested so much in you, you know. So it's data that's speaking to it. Population policies have targets, and the targets are the ideal standards. The issue is that. You go to the hospital, Nana. They tell you that your BP is 160, 90. And the doctor tells you, take uh, amlodipine or whatever for your BP to be 180, 90. Is it controlling you? He's telling you. You can defy it. You can actually defy it and not take the medicines that the doctor gives you. Is that not happens. true? And see what happens. <laughs> Let me take a quick you break know. and come here. But when I come back, I just want to find out this three figure no. by you know Professor Rose. Uh, maybe it's for the Western world, but we are in Africa. Okay. We need more babies, don't we? Okay. We're coming back. Yeah. Thank you very much for staying, and it's getting quite interesting because now we are delving into population issues, and uh, we have the population ombudsman with us. <laughs> this, this figure three, a dog, I think, uh, you know, one would say in Europe, Maybe even one is too much, two is too much. But, there are, but, but this is Africa. I mean, three is the beginning. Yeah, you know, you, you, you need the average African man who say, look, I need to have more kids. Yeah. There's this uh, one, you know, some may pass, and then you still have some, the others will say, look, should I have a farm or have, you know, hands to help? And, you know, for your own dignity, that is a look like your dad. Oh, no. I have boys, let me have girls, I have girls, let me have boys, you know, <laughs> I have eight, why don't I just add two, 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 two round eight, up to ten, to ten. And, and, and that's Africa. Yes. I mean, should we tie ourselves down to the European three? No, we shouldn't actually tie ourselves down to the European three. The issue is that, Nana, uh, you have to look at the health of the woman too, mm -hmm. you know, and then the health of the child. Research shows that child mortality and maternal mortality increases with high birth order. That's the research. It shows that the higher the birth order, after three, the mortalities are higher. Below 18 years, the mortalities are high. When the baby is born less than two years interval, the mortalities are high. So that is what informs what you do. Because if you, if you have a target of bringing maternal mortality down, and you don't look at this, then it will be extremely difficult for you to bring maternal mortality down because mortalities are higher in higher birth orders, mm. you know. So we, we have to let people have the information and make the choices. And should, should we support people to make good choices or not? 
that's questions that we have to ask ourselves. You know, when we were uh, not saving the energy, the government introduced the prepaid, and now we are all trying to conserve energy. So should we just look on and let women die out of ignorance? I remember some years back, if you were a rich man and your wife was very fat, it means you were a good husband, you were taking good care of the woman. So they started dying of cardiovascular diseases. Then we started looking at the BMI and now started conforming. So you go to the hospital, you ask the doctor, what is my BMI? And they tell you you are obese, you are overweight, and then you try to fall in it. There's norms for optimal life, and we need to know. Before you can take a decision, you have to have informed uh, uh, choice. You, know, you, should, you should have the information to take the decision. You see, mm -hmm. so it is important that we know that these are the risk factors. The high birth order is a risk factor. The low, I mean, uh, uh, 18 years younger having kids is a risk factor. Having children, short birth intervals are risk factors. The maternal mortalities have gone down in the Western countries because <coughs> they have reduced this number of risky births. Mm. It is just like Nana trying to reduce road traffic accidents, and you are letting 90-year-olds drive without spectacles. You cannot reduce road traffic accidents that way. Neither can you reduce road traffic accidents allowing 14-year-olds to drive. You cannot reduce road traffic accidents that way. So if you really want to reduce road traffic accidents, you have to disaggregate your data and make sure that people who are at higher risk are discouraged from driving. Mm -hmm. That is how it is. So women, or if you are in a condition of higher risk, you are discouraged or encouraged to make a good choice. You know, life is really about choices. Would you rather have two or three children and you stay healthy to look after them? Or you would rather ten children, you can look after any of them very well, and you can look after yourself very well. Remember that, Nana, we all have 24 hours in a day to do everything. Mm -hmm. Just like the footballers have 90 minutes in a day to score. The boxers have six rounds to prove your, your this thing. You don't have infinite time and energy. Mm -hmm. you know? So you have to make choices. And that is what the Bible talks about. You have to be prudent in everything that you do. The, the, the adage of God will provide. How, how does it factor in here? Because there's some... Yeah who you know, don't have, they don't, they don't have, but they are on their fourth going on their faith. Uh, but they strongly believe that you know, God will provide. No, no, I also strongly believe that God provides. But for me, God provides the raw materials. We are in the business of co-creation with God. He provides the raw materials and we make finished product out of it. So God has provided you with a human being and you have to make capital out of that human being. That is God providing. Because you can never create a human being, mm. no matter how hard you do try. So that is God providing. But God provides the raw materials. He gives you the oil in the belly of the, of the, of the, of the soil. And then you use your wisdom to unearth it. He gives us the universe. And you use your wisdom to take robots to the skies. So that is God providing. We couldn't make the oil by ourselves. We couldn't make the human beings by ourselves. We couldn't make the air by ourselves. So he has provided, and we co-create with him. So that is the provision. It is not that... So God is not going to give you petrol? God is not going to give you petrol. God will give you... The crude. The crude, and you make petrol out of it. God will give you the human being, and you make the human capital out mm -hmm. of it. So God has provided. So it's not just making the, the human being and, and not making capital. That is not how God said we should interpret his words. I think, I think that that's very defining. I think that... Uh, uh, He's a god of raw materials. Yes. You, you, you need to convert it. You need to convert it. That is wow. why we are co-creating with God. That's the power he gave us. Mm -hmm. That is why the dogs are not co-creating anything. The cats are not co-creating anything. But the cats are pro reproducing. So if it is death giving birth, then probably the fish are doing a better job than us. Mm -hmm. Because they can do plenty in an hour. We can't catch up with mm -hmm. them, you know. So God providing and God giving us is the co-creation power that God has given us. Turning the raw material he's given us into finished products for our use. What is it that makes us so afraid to talk about fertility issues? 
uh, you know, you have interview, you know, big personalities and off camera, they will agree with you that the yeah, population is growing, we have to slow down. But on camera, they, they don't want to, I mean, uh, you, you are in there, you've, you know, gone around talking about fertility. Why, why is it so sensitive? Why are we scared to approach it head on? Well, I think that is how change begins. Initially, we were scared to talk about education. We were scared to talk about HIV. So we are now comfortable with it. So we just have to stay at it and we'll probably uh, be able to talk. Because the issue is that Nana, the, the, the fact is undisputable. Arguing about it, for me, in my mind, is just delaying the time that you accept it. Because mm. fact is fact. And why is Africa so rich yet so poor? Because we are not in co-creating what God has given us. And it starts with the human being. It's not the numbers, but the quality of human being. You know. And God said, God said, Nana, that every one of us is made in his image and likeness. So every single person, that is why we have to treat people with care, with, with honor, and with dignity. Because we all have God in ourselves. You know. So we cannot just take that for granted. Mm -hmm. I think he will not be very happy with us, or he is not happy with us, actually. And, and you think we will break that fear, and one day family planning will be on everybody's lips, where, you know, woman who, you know, of age will say, look, I have to start my family planning now. Because, you no, know, no, it's, family it's planning is a survival thing. Why is it that all of us, the whole world, black, white, everybody, has nine months in the mother's womb? And the Chinese are eating, living for 80 years. And Nigeria is living for 54 years or something. And Ghana is 62 years. Life is full of choices. You make good choices. You know, God is a God of abundance. If we obey his, his will, he gives us abundant life. So I don't think that we littering children with, on the street is God's will. He said his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't think that the street of heaven is littered with children who don't have food to eat. It's littered with children who, who are being maltreated, who are being raped, who are being trafficked. You know. So the earlier we come to the realization, the better. God gave us just one son, telling us that one is good enough because one is still, I am still in that one. So why don't you have the number that you can praise God with? that the people can also grow up and be productive for continuity sake instead of because I seriously wouldn't want to be on the street now mm -hmm. if my mommy had left me on the street I'm sure I would have cursed her because you don't have to have me if you can't take care of me you know it is not fair it is not the best thing to do yes I have a right to have children but the child has a right to live your right to reproduction should not compromise my right to life you shouldn't compromise the rights of other people living in the country. Why are we having uh, uh, barbed wires all over in the country? Because people have not been responsible. Why don't we have barbed wires in homes in the Western countries? You just stand on the door, open the window, and get into your room without any security, no dog, no barbed wires. Hmm, this interview could go on and on and on, but unfortunately, that's what time would allow us. Doc, I want to say thank you very much. I want to urge you all on your crusade on education to bring fertility and family planning on the forefront. Thank you for being a medical doctor and uh, healing people. And uh, to you at home, thank you for tuning in. I want to say thank you so much to uh, Imperial Homes who uh, give us their premises every now and then to do our interviews. And the number is 024366. 2001 024 that's Tantees. they give me my shirts for the show so give them a call and get yourself a nice shirt till i come to you with a different personality it's been wonderful having you thank you very much doctor thank you for having me Nana.